not long after the turn of the 20th century when Gregor Mendel's theory of genetics became widely known and was accepted, uh, two scientists, Godfrey Hardy, who was a mathematician, and Wilhelm Weinberg, who was a physician, they're here, fused genetics theory with evolution and developed a theory of population genetics uh, around 1908. Uh, their premise is or their theory was based on the premise that, you know, a population is a group of life forms that share genes through reproduction because all members of the population are the same species. They can all interbreed and produce offspring. So uh, they held that basically if a gene frequency changes for any gene in the population, which a gene is a little piece of DNA in a chromosome, if any uh, frequency of a gene changes in a population, then you have evolution. Um, the two ultimate sources of genetic variation in a population are mutation, which is creation of new genes, and meiotic gene shuffling. What that is, is meiosis is the um, production of sperm and egg by a special cell division process. And meiosis shuffles the genes around when it's making sperms and eggs so that every sperm gets a different combination of genes from every other sperm. So no two sperm are identical. So natural selection then based on the mutation and the meiotic gene shuffling picks the best genes and the best combinations of genes in, in each um, uh, generation. So if a trait is controlled by more than one gene, so it says if a trait is controlled by a single gene, oh, just a single gene and, and no other, well then natural selection can't do anything about that because no matter how many members of the population it eliminates, um, you don't change the gene frequency. So if every member of a population, of human population had black hair and half of the people with black hair die, the frequency of black hair is the same as it was before. It's 100%. But if the trait is controlled by two genes or more than two genes, then natural selection will likely pick one gene more than another. And as a result, some genes will become more common and other genes will become more rare. As evolution or as natural selection does this, it can produce three different patterns of evolution. Directional selection, if we look at this graph here, and this is a graph showing the number of individuals surviving in a population versus body mass. If this black curve represents the original distribution of body mass uh, by histogram in a population, and then natural selection operates, and it pushes the black curve to the right, so now we have this blue curve, which is a new thing. That's called directional selection. Um, and now what we have is the average life form is now heavier here than the original population whose average weight was here. Um, if natural selection favored uh, lighter organisms, then you would have the green graph here, where the average individual from the peak of the green graph would be lighter than the average individual in the original population there. So stabilizing selection is where you have um, the average is favored over the extremes. And in this case, it's where you get an even narrower curve uh, distribution uh, in the middle, whereas um, you have notice there are individuals here that are far less than 500 grams and individuals that are far greater than 500 grams. With the, with stabilizing selection, that's narrowed. Uh, that is the case for human birth weight. Um, if a baby is around 67 pounds, it, it has the highest fitness. If it gets above seven pounds, um, there's a chance that mom will die in birth, and that reduces the survivorship of the baby. So babies less than or more than eight pounds uh, are less fit than babies at six and a half to seven pounds because of uh, maternal mortality. And likewise, babies that are less than six pounds run the risk of dying themselves because their, their body mass isn't high enough to survive. So human um, birth weight is a stabilizing entity where on the lower side, the baby itself is getting too small. And on the high side, the baby's uh, size is becoming an impediment to mom's health. So that's stabilizing selection. So there's directional selection where 
and extreme is favored over the average. Stabilizing, where the average is favored over either extreme. Or disruptive, where both extremes are favored over the middle. Um, they found this in birds, where at times the birds with the average beak size die more frequently. Birds with smaller beaks eat smaller seeds. Birds with bigger beaks eat bigger seeds. And the birds with intermediate beaks don't have any seeds that, that they're favored to eat. And then they end up dying more frequently. So disruptive selection is where you lose your hump in the middle and you end up with two humps, like two camel humps in the distribution of the numbers of individuals versus body mass. So um, the Hardy-Weinberg theory is basically this, that uh, a gene frequency will not change if a population meets the following criteria, which is the population must be large, which prevents genetic drift. Genes cannot be allowed to mutate, which obviously is not true in the real world, but in this hypothetical situation, genes cannot mutate, so you can't make new genes. Uh, migration cannot occur. Individuals stay where they are, and they breed with the local populations. Uh, there are no mating preferences, so males and females do not choose mates. Everybody's got an equal chance of finding a mate, and there's no natural selection, so everybody gets to survive. So if you wipe out all five of these conditions, there can't be any evolution. What Godfrey Hardy and Wilhelm Weinberg said was, the strongest force in the five is number five. Natural selection is the strongest force of evolution. So if you take that out, you limit uh, most of what evolution can do. Um, so um, in a Hardy-Weinberg hypothetical population involving the study of a single trait, let's say P represents the dominant gene frequency and Q represents the recessive gene frequency. So in the population, the sum of P, P and Q must be 1. So if P is 50% of the population, Q has to be 50%. If P is 70%, Q has to be 30%. If P is 20%, Q is 80%. So it says for the trait, all life forms will carry two copies of the gene. That's standard genetics. And we'll use big A to represent a dominant gene and little a to represent a recessive gene. So in every reproduction, an embryo is going to either get two big A's, a big A and a little a, or two little a's. And basically, what the Hardy-Weinberg equation is, is p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. That is the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Um, what that equation is used to do is it's used to estimate the number of carriers in a population. So let me explain. Let's suppose that out of 100 people, 81 are recessive for a trait, meaning they they're little a, little a. And you can tell they are because they got red hair. Let's say we're looking at hair. They have red hair. So out of a certain population, 81 people have, uh, have red hair. If 81 out of 100 people have red hair, the frequency of the red hair you know, condition in the population is 81%. If we take the square root, that's Q squared. If we take the square root of Q squared, we can find the root of Q squared, which is Q, and that comes out to 0 0.9. 0 0.9 is the, uh, the value of Q. That is the value of the uh, recessive gene frequency in the population. Q squared is the frequency of red-haired people. Q is the frequency of the red-haired gene. Well, if Q is 0 0.9, that must be, uh, that P is then has to be 0.1, because P and Q have to add up to 1. And if P is 0.1, then the, the carriers, which are 2PQ, are 2 times 0.9 times 0 0.1 or 0.18. 18% of the population, or 18 people out of 100, uh, out of that 100, are carriers of red hair. Um, so in other words, they might have black hair because red's recessive, but they carry the red hair gene. So out of, to summarize now, out of the 81 out of the 100 people are red haired, another 18 can't, are probably like black haired, but they carry the red haired gene, and that only leaves one person left who is pure black haired. They would have big A, big A. So 81 people are little a, little a. 18 people are big A, little a. And one person is big A, big A. So, how do new species evolve? Um, we think it's because of geographic isolation most of the time. Uh, speciation is the term that's used to describe the evolution of new species from a single ancestor. And it's based on habitat and niche. 
Um, habitat is where an organism lives and niche is what the organism does. Basically, if an organism is geographically isolated by something, rivers, mountains, oceans, whatever, from the rest of its population, the environment will then cause it to evolve differently than the other populations that it's separated from. Uh, if you take the Galapagos Islands out in the Pacific Ocean off the west coast of South America, which you can see in the diagram, um, birds on each of these islands experience different island conditions. Some of the islands are sort of tropical, other islands are like deserts. And so different birds on different islands evolve differently because of the different conditions. Natural selection picks features that are suitable for the local conditions. And as a result, about uh, 13 or 14 different species of finches evolved on the islands, whereas in all of North America we have the purple finch, the American goldfinch, and the house finch, and that's it. We don't have a bunch of different finches, but because there were all these different islands with different environments, you end up with over a dozen species of finches. It's all based on geographic isolation. Each island is geographically isolated from every other island and has different growing conditions, which sets the stage for the evolution of different species on the different islands. So some terms here to, to be aware of. Uh, divergent evolution is the evolution of like two new species from a con common ancestor. Die means two. Adaptive radiation, on the other hand, is the evolution of many new species at once. And you, adaptive radiation uh, tends to occur when a successful species migrates into a many different areas simultaneously, and then in each area it evolves differently. Um, uh, all of those new species that are adaptively radiated will have homologous structures. In other words, they're, they'll have uh, very similar bone structures, very similar uh, internal organ structures, because they all came from the same common ancestor, but then evolved differently on different islands. Now that contrasts with convergent evolution. You do see on different continents similar looking animals like the wombat which is a kind of a beaver looking animal that lives in Australia looks like the American beaver and that's only because the two animals evolved in different environment or, or different places but in similar environmental conditions and so they end up to both look brown they both walk on four legs um, and they both look like furry rodents but as it turns out the wombat's a marsupial and it's more closely related to kangaroos and the beaver is a rodent, and it's more closely related to rats. But they ended up looking similar because the environments that they uh, evolved in were similar. So the environments molded a similar species in the two different cases. Uh, anytime you have two unrelated animals evolving to look similar, we call that convergent evolution. And any similar structures that they have are called analogous. For example, a butterfly wing and a bird wing if you look at them closely, you think, oh, wow, uh, gee, did they come from the same ancestor? And the answer is no. The butterfly and the bird a long, 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 long time ago did evolve from a common ancestor, but that ancestor did not have wings. The insect wing was evolved independently of the bird wing, and you can tell that by dissecting the two wings and taking them apart, you realize that the two wings have entirely different anatomies. And as a result, um, we call that an analogy not a homology. So homologous structures are structures that evolved from the same ancestor in different environments by adaptive radiation. Analogous structures come about by convergent evolution of different species from different ancestors evolving to look similar because of similar uh, environmental conditions. So you, you'll see um, the, the bat wing is actually a hand. Uh, whereas a bird wing is actually an entire arm. Uh, a whale flipper or a dolphin flipper has a hand in it. Anteaters have hands. Uh, moles have hands that are adapted for digging. Horses stand on their hands, right on their fingers, actually. And monkeys have grasping hands. The, the pentadactyl limb came from a common ancestor. Five fingers, each finger divided into little digits. And it adaptively radiated around the world into the uh, bat structures, dolphin structures, anteater structures, mole structures, etc. Horses, pigs, and uh, monkeys, and even more. So the last thing to mention here before we move out is, you know, uh, the fossil record seems to show an evolutionary pattern that looks something like this, where 
uh, organisms live for a long, long time, and then all of a sudden they change into a new form. Whereas evolutionary theory seems to propose that organisms are always slowly evolving in every generation. We call this punctuated equilibrium. The fossil record supports a concept of punctuated equilibrium where organisms live unchanged for millions of years and then either rapidly change or become extinct. Uh, but the way natural selection theory works is more on the minute scale. They should be evolving a little bit all the time. What we think is that both, this is called gradualism here, where things are always gradually evolving. We think both of these are correct. We think that the fossil record is incomplete and we are not going to find all the transitions between uh, different forms of a species. Uh, and as a result, as because fossils are so um, randomly formed, and so we think it, this was going on all along, but if the environment doesn't change for a long period of time, the species don't change for a long period of time. Then if the environment suddenly changes, the species either change or become extinct, depending on if they have enough genetic variation to withstand the change. So we think both of these theories are actually correct, but the fossil record best supports this concept, and uh, the theory of natural selection, the way we see it, um, supports this concept of uh, gradualism. Now, the last topic here before I go to the next uh, screen lecture is, you know, some biologists will present evolution as a fact, and technically it's not. None of us were here when things were evolving. It is extremely compelling that evolution occurred, but I want to emphasize that science is not about truth or false of this, it is about trying to find the best explanation for the evidence at hand. And right now, the best explanation for evidence at hand is that evolution occurred. Uh, the compelling evidence of fossils in the ground and, and, and so many more things seems to indicate that evolution has occurred, you know, over time. So in the next screen lecture, I'll talk about the evidence that is out there to, to support the concept that evolution has occurred.